Sam for her first song. sent his one and only son to offer up himself as a propitiation, as a sacrifice on the cross to take our sins upon himself in exchange for his righteousness. So now when you look upon us, you see your children, you see your son. Father, we are so grateful and thankful for what you've done for us. And we pray over the city uh, that it might be washed over uh, with the gospel. We pray that you can use each and every one of us to be the lights of the world, to be the salt of the earth that we might draw others to you. Just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's go over a couple of quick things. So we've, we're, we're moving right along, but we're in the, in the building. We're, I'm sure I know I pray for everybody. To, we're thankful for all those who sacrifice their time each and every day to come over. There's a lot of stuff to be done. I know everybody's got 100 things to do. Um, Apart from all the work that needs to be done, but, uh, we're so thankful for the, those who come and, and help each and every day. So We're making progress. So if you went over today and look at the progress, the progress that you probably see is that we've, we've tore a lot of stuff up and we've made a really big mess. But if you squint really, really hard, you'll see that there's some progress uh, in there. So uh, we've, we're making right along. There's a, another long week coming up ahead of us as we get ready for our campers on mission who are showing up at the end of the week. Um, and then, of course, another long week next week as we're, we're there trying to assist them and the work that they're going to help us with. 
Um, our men's breakfast is next Saturday at 8, and we're going to be meeting over uh, at, our, at our new building uh, for that. Go ahead. And then, I think I've got it on there. So, they, And then, of course, next Sunday, um, we'll have the Lord's Supper and then our um, our fellowship lunch afterwards. So there's, there's a sign-up sheet on that back table for the fellowship lunch. And then the, that week after that, our campers on mission from the, the 5th through the 12th, um, our main responsibility really is going to be that Monday um, through Friday. Um, there's another uh, sheet up there if somebody would like to help uh, feed everyone there. Get with Cindy um, after service and she can kind of go over kind of some of the things that are needed. She's heading up our, our lunches for that week of the, it's really the 7th through the, the 11th, that Monday through Friday. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we get everybody fed really well and take care of them. We're so appreciative of all, th all those folks who are taking time and many of them are going to be traveling quite a distance. That's why they're campers on mission. They pull their camper, they they pull into wherever they're going to work, and they, they set up shop all week. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of them as well. So that's next week. Um, that's all the announcements we have this morning. Our scripture reading is going to be from 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 10. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own passion, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy.
searched me and known me. You know when I sit up and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where else shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. On that day would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me! They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? 
Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Yeah, the ushers come forward. Tom, would you pray for us this morning? Father, we thank you so much just for the opportunity to be in your house once again and to worship you and to, to show our love for you and to opportunity to give. Lord, we thank what you've given for us. Uh, we're just so grateful. We thank you in Jesus' name. spices and that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They were there when his body was taken off of the cross. They saw it wrapped in linen cloths. They saw the body being placed in the tomb. They saw the stone rolled in front. All that took place on Friday evening when they went back on Sunday morning, the stone was rolled back and the tomb was empty. They're perplexed, they're puzzled as to why it would be empty. There's no logical explanation. Why would somebody come and roll the stone back and take the body? But then all of a sudden these two men, these angels appear in dazzling appearance. They were like lightning. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but has risen. They didn't have any expectations of that tomb being empty when they arrived that morning. They didn't come looking for Jesus. They already knew where he was, or at least where he was supposed to be. They didn't come looking for a miracle. They weren't there to be the first witnesses to the resurrection. They were simply there to prepare the body for permanent burial, as was their custom. When they were asked, why do you seek the living among the dead? That probably seemed like a strange and odd question. They weren't seeking the living among the dead. They came there seeking the dead. That's why they brought all these spices and ointments. That he's not here. He has risen. These messengers, these angels of God, has delivered some of the greatest messages in all of Scripture Remember back in Luke chapter 2, the message was, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And now in chapter 24, he is not here, but has risen. Our Savior is born. Our Savior is risen. These are two of the most significant Christian doctrines that we have. The incarnation and the resurrection. And Jesus wasn't just raised from the dead. And in his ministry, Jesus raised many people from the dead. But those people would eventually die again. Jesus wasn't raised. He was resurrected. He will never taste death again. The grave has no power or dominion over him. He is the first fruits, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Christ, the first fruits. Then at his coming... Those who belong to Christ. Paul is using Old Testament language, the feast of the first fruits. All the first fruits were given to God with the expectations, the confidence that God would give the harvest in the end. Paul says that Christ is the first fruits, and we have a confident expectation that when He returns, that we are the harvest, and we too will be resurrected. He is risen. That was the message. And now all these reports of the resurrection are starting to circulate around town. But even his trusted disciples, 
find the message hard believe. Pure nonsense is actually the word that Luke uses there. Some of them go to the tomb to see for themselves. And they found it just as the women had said. It was empty, but him they did not see. But they leave marveling at what had happened in Luke 24, 13 to 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who do not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of our women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village in which they were going, and he acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he was opening up to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told them what had happened on the road and how he had known how they had known was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Back in verse 13, that same day, so it's still Sunday. The women had went to the tomb earlier that morning. They had found it empty, reported everything that they seen to the disciples, and now it's later in the day, and these two men are headed to Emmaus which Luke tells us is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now that number two is important, at least for the Jewish people, because according to the Mosaic law, you had to have two witnesses in order for the testimony to be valid. That morning, there were more than two women at the tomb who witnessed the empty grave and the resurrection. And although Luke doesn't record it, Matthew does in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. <coughs> as he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took a hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This makes this account all the more astonishing. 
because according to the Jewish law, women were not allowed to be witnesses. Their testimony was not valid, yet Jesus appeared to them first, making them the first witnesses to the resurrection. If you're going to concoct a story about a resurrection, then you wouldn't use women who weren't allowed to be witnesses. You would have used the most prominent apostles as the first witnesses, Peter and John and James. But no, Scripture tells us that at first they didn't believe. It was the women who first saw the resurrected Christ. We recall back in Luke chapter 2 when Jesus was being presented at the temple as an infant, he runs across a man named Simeon who says that his eyes have now seen the redemption of Israel and a prophetess named Anna who was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Two witnesses. Two witnesses to the Messiah's arrival. And now in chapter 24, we have these two witnesses to the Messiah's resurrection. So as they're walking down the road, <coughs> they're talking about everything that had happened among themselves. They're talking about Jesus and his ministry and his miracles, about he was turned over and he was crucified. He died, he was put in the tomb, he was buried. And now they're hearing stories of the resurrection in verses 14 and 15. They're talking with each other about all these things that had happened while they were talking and discussing together. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. It's emphasized there in those two verses three times that they're talking and discussing. They're talking about Jesus and the events that had just taken place. And all of a sudden, Jesus himself enters into the conversation, except they do not recognize him. In fact, Luke says their eyes kept them from recognizing him in verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. This is a divine passive. It's meaning that God kept these two men from recognizing Jesus. And when you read John and some of the other Gospels, this was the case several times. That at first they did not recognize Jesus in his resurrected form until he allowed them to see him. And we see because of these two men, first Jesus had to teach them about the necessity of his death, burial, and resurrection and how it was the fulfillment of scriptures before they were allowed to see. You cannot see God until you know who God is. That's how it is for all of us you know, on a figurative and even a spiritual level until we recognize the necessity of Jesus' death for our sins and the importance of the resurrection for our redemption, we cannot see or know Jesus for who he truly is. These two men couldn't see who he was yet because they did not perceive, they did not believe the reports. The world doesn't recognize Jesus either, and it's for the very same reason. They don't want to see, they don't want to believe, because once they see who he is, then they see who they are sinners and darkness does not like the light because their wickedness is exposed in verse 17 he speaking of jesus said to them what's this conversation you're holding with each other as you walk and they stood still looking sad right jesus enters the conversation unknowns unbeknownst to them and then casually just says so what are you guys talking about knowing full well what they're talking about. They're talking about him and everything that had just happened the previous couple of days. And one of them, Cleopas, responds there in verses 18 to 24. One named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened in these days? He said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, to God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. 
And some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Their response to Jesus, are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? Jesus was a well-known person. His three-plus years of ministry, he would have been well-known. His ministry would have reverberated all throughout Judea. Hundreds of miracles. Everyone would have known about him on some level. You had to have been living under a rock to not at least know or have heard about Jesus. Over in Acts chapter 26, Paul, when he gives his own defense of himself, says something very similar. In Acts 26, 24 to 29, Paul is now before King Agrippa. This is Herod Agrippa. This was the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the king of Israel when Jesus was born. Now, some 30 years later, his grandson, Agrippa, is the king. And Festus is the governor. He's the procurator. He would have hold the same position as Pilate did during the crucifixion. So Agrippa goes and sees Festus in Caesarea. Paul's been in prison for two years. Festus tells Agrippa, hey, I've got this guy Paul in prison. Why don't you hear what he has to say? So they bring out Paul. He begins to preach to them, give him his testimony about his conversion on the road to Damascus. And this is where we pick up the conversation in Acts 26, 24. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul says, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for they have not been done in a corner. Jesus' ministry wasn't done in the dark. It wasn't done in a closet. It wasn't done in a corner. Everyone would have known about this. The spread of Christianity wasn't done in a corner. And here Paul, he was a great orator. He is now putting Agrippa on the spot. Agrippa, you're magnificent. You're so smart and educated. You're so well known. None of these things have escaped your sight. So if he would have said that things escaped his sight, then he wouldn't have been all those things. Surely the king knows that none of these things escape his notice. And Agrippa knows what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to paint him into a corner. So Agrippa responds, or in verse 27, Paul is still speaking. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. He asked him a question and then he answered it for him. Surely you believe the prophets as any good Jew would. Agrippa said to Paul again, now Agrippa knows what Paul's trying to do. He's painting him into a corner to where he doesn't have any way to respond. You think you'd convince me to be a Christian in such short time? Paul says, whether short or long, I would to God that only not you, but also everyone who hears me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul had a sense of humor. Whether it takes a long time or a short time, I'll preach the gospel as long as it takes, if that's what it takes for somebody to come to Christ. I wish everyone would become a Christian as I am. I'm sure Paul held up his hands, except for these clink, clink chains where you've got me in prison for no reason whatsoever. Jesus' ministry didn't take place in the dark. It was well known. And of course, that's why they killed him. He became too well known. Better for one man to die than whole nation to perish. So as they're talking on this road to Emmaus, how could you not know what's going on after he's been handed over to the Gentiles? He was crucified. That would have sent shockwaves through the city. And now three days later, there's these reports of the resurrection that are beginning to circulate. How can you not know what's going on? How do you not know about these things? And Jesus responds by saying, what things? He wants to hear from their own mouth what things. He wants to hear what their testimony. Who do you say that I am? What do you believe happened? Who do you think Jesus is? And when we read through this, they kind of give a cookie cutter response. This is the same kind of response that many Christians, even non-Christians, would give if you asked them who Jesus was. He was a good man. He was a prophet. He was good in word and deed, mighty works, cut some miracles. 
fed some people, did a lot of great things. We even hoped that he was the one. We thought that maybe he was the Messiah. But our rulers delivered him over to death and he was crucified. And now here we are three days later. Some of the women in our company went to the tomb this morning and didn't find the body. Instead, they said they saw two angels who told them that Jesus was alive. Some people even in our company went to see the tomb for themselves and they found it empty. But they didn't see Jesus. So as we read through this, we're, they're recounting all this. Seems like they're expressing their disappointment in all that had happened. Like all the other disciples and everybody else, they had a complete misconception and understanding of who Jesus was as the Messiah. When they said that they were hoping that he was the one to redeem Israel, what they meant was that they hoped that he was going to redeem them from Roman occupation. They would set the throne back up. The monarchy of David would live on and they would once again become a sovereign nation. Almost similar to 1 Samuel, when the people go cry to Samuel and say, we want a king. We want a man to be king over us like every other nation. Samuel says, God is your king. And their response was, no, we want a man to be king. We want to be just like everyone else. But as they see in a moment, Jesus, in fact, did redeem Israel and everyone else for that matter. He just didn't do it the way everyone believed he was going to do it. His redemption brought with it the kingdom of God and for the forgiveness of sins. As he told them during the Last Supper, which two of these, these two men may have been a part of. We see that they were there in the language that they used. They were there when the women brought back the report that early Sunday morning. They were part of this larger group of disciples. They may have even been there the night of the Last Supper back in chapter 22. Verses 14 through 20. When the hour came, he reclined the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it till it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this. Divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread when he had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that's poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus told them what kind of Messiah he was going to be. He was the kind that was going to make a new covenant with them in his blood. They hoped he was going to be the Messiah, but now he's dead. And on top of that, it says, there's this other thing that's contributing to their sadness. Some of the women in our group said they saw angels that said he's alive. As though we didn't have enough to deal with, that our master, our rabbi, has been taken from us and killed. We're now getting all these reports that he's walking around alive somewhere. which implies several people went to investigate the empty tomb, not just Peter. We know from John chapter 20, not only Peter, but the other disciple went with him. And many scholars believe that the other disciple was John. That's how he describes himself in his own gospel. And I wouldn't doubt that at some point that morning, all the apostles went to go see the empty tomb after reports kept coming back around. They wanted to go see for themselves In John's chapter of the resurrection in John 20, John says that Peter and the other disciple went and the other disciple made it there first. Peter might have been better than me at a lot of other things, but I beat him in the race to the tomb. Why other, what other reason would John include that into his gospel than to let everyone know that he was faster than Peter? What's really been said in all these words that these two men from Emmaus are saying is that they didn't really believe the reports. They didn't accept the women's testimony. The evidence of the empty tomb was not enough to believe that Jesus had risen. 
in verses 13 through 19, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about the things that had happened. When they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, what's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? He said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. They responded. And now Jesus rebukes them and gives them the correct understanding of what things had just taken place. When he asked them what had just taken place, this was their response. Jesus was a good man. He was a prophet. He was mighty in word and deed. We thought maybe he was the Messiah, but probably not because he's dead now. And people are saying that he's risen. But all this seems like pure nonsense to us. That was their response when Jesus said, what things? And now he gives them the correct answer on what things had just taken place. In verses 25 to 27. He said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. When Jesus begins to rebuke them, he doesn't rebuke them because they didn't believe the testimony of the women. He rebukes them because they didn't believe the testimony of the prophets that foretold everything about him. They should have known. They had all the information right in front of them the whole time. It's written in the scriptures. It all points to him. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer? He told them this was going to happen on several occasions. Twice in chapter 9, he pulled them inside and said that he was going to suffer, he was going to be crucified, and on the third day he would rise again. And again in chapter 18, he tells them again. He's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, he's going to be mistreated, he's going to be crucified, and on the third day, rise again. Those are just three times that it was recorded. No telling how many other times he told them that it's not recorded. He not only told them, Jesus says the prophets foretold all this as well. And we've looked at a few over the last several weeks, including Isaiah 53, which is probably the most prominent of all the texts of the suffering Messiah. Verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The greatest sermon never recorded. Sure would have liked Luke to include that conversation. But when we read the rest of the New Testament, we do learn all the things that Jesus had told them. Beginning in Acts, with Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Jesus in John's Gospel said that if I do not leave, the Comforter will not come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, but once I leave, he will come, and he will recall to you everything that I said. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the apostles when they were indwelled with the Holy Spirit is they remembered everything that Jesus said, including what he said about Moses and all the prophets concerning himself. On the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit's poured out, as soon as Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, he begins to preach. And he begins to point them all back to the Old Testament immediately. He starts quoting Joel chapter 2, that in the last days the Spirit is going to be poured out on all. He quotes a couple of the Psalms that point to Christ. When we get to Acts chapter 17 verses 1 through 3 we see that Paul does the same thing not only in Acts but when you read his 13 letters continually quoting dozens and dozens of Old Testament scriptures in Acts 17 1 through 3 
when they passed through in Philippus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Paul went in, as was his custom. So when it's saying this is, his, this is what Paul did, everywhere he went, he went to the synagogue, to the Jew first, and then to the Greek. He'd go to the synagogue, and he would preach as many weeks as they would allow him until he got sick and tired of him. And once they kicked him out, then he would go start preaching to the Gentiles. This was his custom everywhere he went. On three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Paul reasons from the scriptures, we have to remember that during this time, the scriptures were the Old Testament scriptures. There were no New Testament scriptures that hadn't been written yet. When you read the book of Hebrews, it's named the book of Hebrews because it's written to the Hebrews. It has dozens and dozens of Old Testament scriptures. Whoever wrote that book said, here's the Old Testament, here's Jesus, and here is how it all goes together when you read that whole book. It's writing to the Jews, telling him that he is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. Paul continually points to Jesus from the Old Testament scriptures. Once they get to where they're going, to Emmaus, Jesus pretended like he was going to keep on going. But they insisted that he stay, so he does. They sit down, Jesus breaks the bread and blessed it in the similar fashion as he did on the Last Supper we read, where these two may have even been there three days prior when it took place, because it says as soon as he did that, their eyes were open, and they recognized who he was, and then he vanished. Verse 31, and their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. That word recognize, it means to know, to understand, to perceive. Before, they could not perceive who he was. But now they can see. Because Jesus has come to open the eyes of the blind. Not just physically, but spiritually. Which we all were at one time before he opened our eyes. So that we could see him. In verse 32, they said to each other, Did our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Right before they saw him, they heard the gospel. He preached to them, and it burned inside of them, and the word of God drew them in, and only then could they see. It was only then could they perceive who Jesus was. Not just a prophet, not just the Messiah, but the suffering servant who's come to take away the sin of the world. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. It's through the revealed and proclaimed word of God that people come to faith. It's what Paul says in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Someone has to Proclaim it. If you read all the verses that are above that, someone has to go. Someone has to say something. There's a quote that's attributed to Thomas Aquinas. It goes something like this. Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. It's cute, and I understand what he's trying to say, but it's always necessary to use words. Yes, we want to live out our life so others can see Christ in us. But it is always necessary to use words because faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. They heard, they saw, and they believed. And what does a person do when this happens to them? They run and go tell everyone else the good news. That's what these men did in verses 33 to 35. They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. 
And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. They got up that very same hour. They took that seven miles back to Jerusalem on foot in the middle of the night to go proclaim to anyone who would listen that Christ is risen. And by the time they got there, others, including Peter, had already seen Christ and was proclaiming that he is risen indeed. Luke begins his gospel this way back in chapter 1. Remember we were in chapter 1 two years ago? I know you do. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers to the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Luke wasn't an original apostle or an original disciple. He was a companion of Paul. There's no indication in Scripture that Luke ever saw the resurrected Christ. All his information came from eyewitness testimony. He bent back and researched this all on his own, speaking probably to these two men from Emmaus to get their story as he wrote in his gospel. And it was all for the purpose of verse 4. Not only is he giving this to Theophilus, who's probably the contributor, the one who's funding the writing, it was very expensive to not only write the gospel, but Luke wrote Acts as well. To so use all that writing material would have been very expensive, but it all comes down to verse 4, so that you would have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. And that word, to have certainty, or in some of your translations it might be translated as know, so that you would know there in verse 4. It's the exact same word that's used in chapter 24 and verse 31 when it says they recognized him. To see, to know, to perceive, to know for certain, to recognize. That's why Luke wrote his gospel. It's so that we could know, so that we could understand, so that we could perceive, so that we could recognize who Christ is. So that we would know for certain all the things that we have been taught, believing the testimony of the eyewitnesses who were there. When you read the scriptures, when you search the scriptures, when you study the scriptures, when you hear the scriptures, that word penetrates your heart, your mind and soul, just as like it did these two men. Did our hearts not burn within us? When he was preaching the gospel to us, when he was telling us all the things, when he opened up the scriptures to us, that's what the word is supposed to do. It's supposed to burn within your heart. It's only then you can see Jesus for who he truly is. And then your response will be just like Thomas. My Lord and my God. The one who ransomed us from sin. The one who rescued us from death. The one who paid the price to save us. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to him. Or no one comes to the Father but by him. If you want to know about salvation, then come to the one whose name means the Lord is my salvation. If you want to know about love, come to the one who's demonstrated the greatest act of love that while we were still sinners, he died for us. If you want to know about life, come to the one who created all life. If you want to know about everlasting life, then come to the one who has been raised to everlasting life. His grave is the only grave in human history that since empty this morning because he's not dead. His grave is empty because he has risen. Father, we thank you for the risen and resurrected son who crawled upon that cross accepting the nails in his hands and feet so that our sin might remain there. He took upon our sin, carried it to the grave, buried it there, left it there, and then rose to a newness of life. 
And we know that when we put our faith and trust in him, we too will raise to that same newness of life. He is the first fruits, and those of us who belong to him, when he comes, will be raised up with him. We will experience the same resurrection he experienced on that Sunday morning. We pray if there's one here who's never come to that moment of life and their faith or the preaching or the teaching of the scriptures has not burned within their hearts as the scripture has been opened up to them. We pray that today is that day that the scripture, that the word of God is that sharp two-edged sword has pierced the soul, pierced the heart, all the way down to the bone and marrow that brings repentance and salvation. We pray over this community that we know that there are many hundreds living with just in blocks this morning, still sitting in their homes, ignorant of the gospel, ignorant of the word. We pray that we're just like these two men, that once our eyes are recognized, that once our hearts burn with the scriptures, that we rise up at the same hour and we run to go tell someone the good news that he is risen. The grave cannot hold him. Death has no dominion over him. Death has no victory and no sting. And we know that when we put our faith in him, we will not die. Because he is the resurrection and the life. Father, we praise and honor. We pray that we glorify your name this morning. For it's in that name of Jesus we pray. Amen. He is risen. The only grave in history that's empty because he's not dead. He's risen. Paul says, risen for our justification. Meaning that his resurrection is what now proves that we are not guilty before God. Our sins are cleansed from as far as the east is from the west. So when we stand before God, he doesn't see a filthy sinner. He sees, he sees his son. A reflection of Christ is what he sees when we stand before him, when we put our faith and trust in him. Do you have any questions about repentance, about salvation, baptism? Sure, love to meet with you. I'd like everybody to please stand. We're going to worship through song one more time. Don't forget men's breakfast next Saturday over at the new building. Next Sunday we have our uh, fellowship uh, dinner after service. And then a week after our campers on mission. So if anybody would like to help Cindy with those lunches, get with Cindy um, after service as well.